Oh, baby, go. Ah, hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors. Wherever you are in the world, welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast. Today on the podcast, I have Rahu De Silva, or Gucci, to his friends. Uh, yes. <laughs> he is, how can I put it? He is a stress and fatigue expert, uh, coach. He's recently won Holistic Coach of the Year. Mm. Very nice. Also, he's the founder of a uh, Balance Rebel. Uh, with, well, basically, he helps ed- individuals age stronger and transform their ordinary habits into extraordinary life. My word. Yeah. Hello and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm going to call you M. <laughs> it's right. I am. He's having I trouble am. with my name. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me. No. Thanks way. for having me. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the introduction. Very kind of you. Happy Thank to you. have you here. Happy to have you here. I am always interested. How did you get started in the realm of coaching? How did you get started? Oh, it was. Yeah. So let me introduce myself. It was a synchronicity of events, you know. I, I think that the universe always has a message for us some way, somehow, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I used to uh, put satellites in space in my previous life. So I used to be part, I was a high level executive of the satellite industry, the famous constellations. Huh? And, uh, and then uh, and I was like traveling around the world, living in planes, uh, constantly like on the, on the move or poor food choices and all these things. But I was always very careful with my aging process, right? I always understand that aging is a reality we all gonna age from the moment we are we are born until the moment we're gonna leave this planet we're gonna be aging right it's a reality we're gonna face it so i was always very conscious about how i want to age right being in charge of my own life my own destiny my relationship with the way i eat the way i move the way i work the way i manage all these things but in the meantime covid hit the fan as everybody did right and i was transiting i was transiting between spain portugal so i'm originally portuguese and i was going to dubai so i was and i decided to go from spain to portugal portugal to dubai to visit my mother and i had the luggage of a one weekend one week (laughs) and the moment i'm visiting my parents the borders shut down, the closed, and I'm stranded at my parents' home with the luggage of a weekend and end up staying three months and a half. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, and I could not move, I could not leave the country. So in that meantime, we were given the gift of time. People think that COVID was something bad for us. It actually was a great gift because we all complain we don't have time. We don't have time to spend with the family. We don't have time to enjoy our houses. We don't have time to do anything. And then suddenly, We've been given the gift of time. Mm. Now, it's not the way we wanted to have the time, but we were given the gift of time. We had plenty of time. Most of us were working from home or were stuck at home. And some people decided to get distracted. Some people decide to do uh, their mental health got affected. I was lucky enough to be stranded in Portugal. And all my friends do not do have the, the recreation home in Portugal. So I had a lot of empty houses to use because they were all stuck abroad. <laughs> so I, I, I isolated myself from the world uh, from two weeks and I did emotional reprogram. That was, I reached up to here. Uh, where do I want to go moving forward? All right. Understanding that I probably live already 50% of my life. I'm currently 47 or doing 47 in, in three months. And at that point, I already reached, if you make life expen- expen- expectancy at 80, I would have already reached 50% of my life. Mm. And what, how do I want to live my life moving forward? I realized during the process that I don't want to live in a big city anymore. Uh, and I want to do something different. And I was working for the corporate market, right? Remember, I was putting satellites in space. Yeah. And when I went back, when COVID, uh, when the borders opened and I was able to go back to my house, my homes and, and my family and so on, I realized that, okay, what am I going to do next? And I'm evaluating a couple of opportunities. And a friend of mine at that time, I had a very big profile on Instagram that got hacked and, and they stolen. And I was doing s- small little videos, you know, for workouts and it got very popular. 
Mm. And one of my friends one time said, well, listen, Hui, you, you, you're 40 plus. I was 43 back in the day. You're 43. You're in great shape. You travel around the world. You're a, a high level executive. You maintain a top notch performance. Why don't you help people with that? And that planted the seed in my head, you know, and I was like, hmm, I don't know. I'm still not sure. And I start looking into maybe I can do something with this. And I, I searched about and I came across with health coaching. And then I said to myself, hmm, I can see myself doing this. And believe it or not, the next day, I called the largest nutrition school, which is based in New York, uh, in the world. And uh, I called them and I said, look, I, I saw that you guys have uh, uh, an health coaching online course. I'm interested in taking it. What's the conditions? And the lady tells me, look, either you sign now uh, or you have to wait six months. Oh. Because the, we only do the openings one six months and we're going to close this Friday. This was a Thursday. You need to close. You need to sign up for Friday. And I said, okay, fine. I'm going to sign up. I have nothing to lose. The worst I can do is, okay, I'm going to study a little bit more. Um, two weeks after being in the course, I said, halas, halas means it's okay in Arabic. In Arabic. Um, it, it, it's, it's done. I'm, I'm going to do this for a living. And that was the moment that Balanced Rebel was born. So Balanced Rebel, I was already coaching myself, right? I was a paleo person. I was already doing intermittent fasting even before it became a trend. I'm a crossfitter. I, uh, I travel around the world. I experience high levels of stress. I was closing million dollars deals uh, uh, around the world for, for the company I was working for. And at that moment, I created Balanced Rebel. I didn't want to be uh, just another health coaching company. So I founded Balanced Rebel with the, with the, the assumption that we're going to rebel against our belief system that we can't. We're too old. My best days are gone. This is the way, or uh, I can't do better than what I'm doing now, but in a balanced way, because we believe at Balanced Rebel, we do believe that there's time and space for everything. Mm. There's time and space to drink alcohol. There's time and space to eat junk food. There's time and space to eat, to eat and smart eating. There's time and space to uh, work, to have joy, to sleep, to do everything, as long as you know how to manage it. And there's not such a uh, one single thing like, oh, I'm just going to eat smart and, and be miserable on the other aspects of life. No, life is an integrated complex system of different dimensions, emotional, physical, uh, existential, mental, and so on. So you need to have a little bit of balance on everything. So the, the name of my company came from, we're going to establish a, a rebellion against the belief systems we have in our head that this is the way, but on a balanced way, understanding that there's time and space to do everything. And that was the first, I call it the Balanced Rebel 1.0. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I, with the time, at that time, I want to help busy individuals to reclaim control of their life. And then I, I was reading a book uh, uh, and from a, a, a Canadian school from Precision Nutrition. I was in love with the book. And they opened the first certification worldwide on sleep, stress management, and recovery. And I took it with the book. And uh, yeah, it all started with a book. And then I got it. And during this process, in so. No, what I was the name of the book? Oh, I don't remember the book. Oh. But it was, uh, was, was interesting because I, I got so impressed with the book that I went to search for the school. That's what I have it in my head. I read a lot of books, I don't know all the book's names, but it was so important to me, right? And the thing is, the, from the moment we started, uh, and I started Balanced Rebel in 2021, mm -hmm. on that year, I won the Leadership in Health Coach Award worldwide uh, as a starter. The next year, I was nominated one of the top five coaches in the world to look at. And this year, I got the award. And, uh, and, and the thing is that that's how I came into the coaching business in a nutshell. No, like, you know what? That... That is fantastic, you know, because like this is the thing, like yeah, twenty twenty with COVID, I have like yeah, you say people got their time back, uh yeah, through like the circumstances. What I would simply say is, people had the opportunity to breathe, exhale, and breathe in, exhale and breathe in, 
there are some people which, as you said, yeah, they just got distracted. Other people, like, yeah, fell into a well of despair. And other people mm. saw it as the opportunity to change, uh, to go somewhere else, to take a new direction in their life. Mm. Like, it does surprise, like, the fact that you went from, like, a, I imagine a very successful, well-paid job to, like, going, you know what, I'm switching. Yeah. Like, how difficult was it to, like, say, let go of that one world where, okay, we, if we're talking about the realms of stress, you kind of know what that universe is going to be. You know the ins, you know the outs. There's going to be some crazy moments which kick in because it's satellites. And, yeah, like, if you're working for Imasat or Vsat, you know what I mean, depending where which system it is like what was like then you're going into a universe where okay you have no idea if you're going to get a client the next day uh you like everything is chaos and going from okay you might have worked long hours and traveled and stuff like this but doing longer hours knowing there isn't that sort of financial safety net so like uh, how hard yeah. is it to let go it, it's it, look uh, let's not sugarcoat this. It's a tough, it's a tough decision. But let me explain you a little bit. It's all about managing your stress levels, right? We need to understand that stress can be mental, emotional, physical, existential, and all these things. So the first thing I had to understand is, for me to give up from point A to transition to point B, which is a career transition that I was doing, I need to be very resilient and consistent, right? I need to understand that I had to have at some point some financial stability that would support me to go to have a dip because I'm moving from a steady income, uh -huh. right? To something from the scratch. It's like building a second career because I was, I built a, 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 a very successful career in the telecom industry. And now I'm just like shutting down that career and starting something different. All right. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that I didn't like that career. But I did. I just was not in the mood to sacrifice my well-being for the amount of money that you were paying me, right? And being on a plane and being in constant on the move and the high levels of stress and all these things. So the first question and I, I to answer you is that the beginning was dealing with my own saboteur, my own inner self-talk that used to say, why am I doing this when I can be there and yeah. getting in the, that comfort zone? and living that lifestyle and all and so on and so on so i had to manage my own emotional and mental stress right in ways that how oh, am i gonna do this from a customer perspective mm. i was i had customers from day one from the moment that i signed up for the course people already knew me uh, or either friends or acquaintance they already knew the lifestyle I had. So when they knew that I was going to get the certification, they said, oh, we want to be coached by you because now you're going to take this very seriously. Mm -hmm. And that's why I already had a, a little bit of support. I was also able to, to create a safety net to allow me the transition period. I had to cut a lot of things. I had the lifestyle when I was traveling business class, uh, five-star hotels uh, and expensive dinners, expensive shoes and starting flying low cost, counting the pennies and making sure my expenditures were not uh, unnecessary, mm. right? And that's fine. And I have to accept this. I can't make a transition from point A to point B expecting to have the same situation, no? And then the, the third point was, I took this as a new career. I remember when I started my, my career at 21, I, I was not making the same amount of money. So I had to give myself the opportunity to grow and build the foundations of what's going to become. Mm -hmm. And then I took this as my, how am I going to say, while, while, while other people think, oh, I'm going to retire. At, I, I'm doing this for fun in the sense, I, of course, I'm going to making this out of money. But this is something that makes, gives me joy, gives me a lot of pleasure. So it's not something that I'm so dead or like when people say, oh, I can't wait to finish to finish the, the, the company or to, to finish work or things like that. No, it gives me fun and pleasure, you know. Mm. The first year was very tough. The first year was incredibly tough, especially from a mental perspective. 
doubt, confusion, fear, frustration, all these emotions, you know, and emotional stress is very tough to deal. And that's why so many people think they burned out because they, they have a way too much emotional stress and mental fatigue. Now um, we're on the second year and things starting to be much more fun. Mm. You know, the first year passed and now things are much more fun. But the transition, yeah, I had moments where I said, oh, I want to give up. Mm. Oh, I want to make sure I'm going to, this is not the right decision. You have this doubt. But in the end of the day, I used to use the body to control the mind. So every time I used to have, I was doubting on what I was doing. Because it's normal, right? 80% of your thoughts are negative by default as a survival mechanism. So what I used to do, well, very simple. I used to use the body to control the mind. And how do I do that? Because the brain feeds on oxygen, nutrients, and glucose. And this is delivered by the blood. So when you want to control your reasoning, the best thing you have to do is move your body. So every time I would wake up and get this emotional and mental types of stress building up in my head, I go for a run. Mm. And during the run, I evaluate the quality of my thoughts. How am I thinking? Why am I thinking? Are my thoughts real or unreal? Have in mind that 80% of your thoughts are negative, which means they're not real. Which means that when you live inside your head, you're not living your life. So when I give the opportunity for the blood to flow in my body, I'm giving the opportunity for my brain to get more raw materials to produce good energy and good thinking process. And this helped me to navigate. Yeah, no, I agree. Like, this is the thing. I, when you mention about, yeah, 80% of everything that comes out of your mind is in the realm of a negative like, space. Like, yes, we evolved in, like, well, in a, like an environment where, okay, yeah, you didn't know what was coming around that corner for tens of thousands of years. We are quite fortunate that we live in the age we live in because, okay, I live in the UK. The chances of a bear or a wolf jumping out and taking me down, eh, next, next to zero, <laughs> not unless if there's something what escapes from like either a zoo and all of a sudden it's like, um, you, you're just looking at me like, going, oh, there's something. Mm. But that sort of reaction, it lives within us and trying to, it's not a, say, a case of combating it. It's a case of knowing how to like work with it because that right. sort of negative voice can, will hold you back or you can turn that negative, you can turn that negative voice into a great cheerleader, like yeah. or like doing things within your life. It's one of those things where people just sometimes don't take it on board because it's where it's they're too conditioned with that sort of like with those thoughts, and they don't actually see a new or a different way which is possible for them. From what I've seen. Yeah, you, you're absolutely. You, you you said something very, very, very interesting, and, and very important. That is, despite we're in the 21st century, our body still behaves exactly as we were 300,000 years ago. That's when we came up on the, the planet Earth, right? So, from an evolutionary point of view, you said something very accurate. We're not gonna be. Uh, uh, our life is not going to be endangered by a bear or, or a tiger or our village is going to be attacked by our enemies. No. But our body doesn't know that. And the body reacts the same way, right? So when experience stress, your body is going to shut down non-important systems, digestive, reproductive, immune, because you need to run, you need energy, right? Your blood sugar level is going to increase, your cortisol, adrenaline, and penetrin is going to build up on you so that you have the energy. The problem is that most of the time we're seated behind the desk, mm. but the body doesn't know. The brain doesn't know. Who does know? We do. And we tend to, to, to separate the brain controllers and the body controllers. No, we control our own ecosystem. Mm. Our ecosystem is made with thoughts, mindsets, actions, attitudes, and all these things. So it's up to us 
our perception again our perception of the event that is uh, uh, in front of us understanding if it's good bad manageable and unmanageable so that we can help the body finding the right coping mechanisms to the situation we have in front of us so yes we and fortunately for us the body still behaves the same way from a physical point of view but we're not in the we're not 300,000 years ago we're in the 21st century most of the time behind the desk not moving and dealing with a lot of stress and pressure yeah like this is a thing like a living a sedentary lifestyle um like basically like like many of us well there are there are many reasons why some people go i live a sedentary lifestyle it could be just down to time factors family uh all of these things but the whole point is when you sort of like shut that off i would say with regards to the realm of exercise you're shutting off a major key important mm. realm of energy positivity uh, for like oneself because if you don't if you can't tap into it i think i there is no sort of real percentage i can go this is the percentage you will feel down it affects people mm. in many different ways and yeah as you say sitting behind the desk and look eight hours a day not going out not doing anything and just that is your life yeah look there's a reason why polar bears go a little bit mental in the zoo pace of <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah oh, and by the way animals exp- like humans everybody everybody experience stress and stress is great stress is nothing more than an alarm system that we have built in mm. that tell us that our homeostatic balance has been disrupted right that's the principle of stress that is listen something is happening it can be good bad irrelevant but something is happening that is cutting our attention that's what stress is about now the problem is that that alarm systems to ring consumes resources and if we keep ignoring that alarm system it keeps depleting our internal resources mm. until we run out of resources and that's when people burn out and the problem is that stress multiplies and adds up. So everything becomes worse if we ignore the signs, right? So what is important for us from a stress point of view, and I'm going to talk about with, with exercise, that the most important thing is that let's, let's acknowledge that something is disrupting our balance, our calling us to attention, and take action on it. Because you, when you don't take action on it, that's when things are becoming worse. And at some point, if you don't manage stress, the body will find a way to tell you that something is happening. And that's when you start having digestive problems. That's when you start having weak immune system. That starts when you're having mental fatigue, emotional burnout, and things like that. Now, as remember, I told you, I used to use a lot the body to calm the mind. Mm-hmm. And the, people go to the gym to lose weight. And I said, ah, uh-uh. ah. That's the wrong reasons. If you go to the gym to lose weight or to, or to work out, that's the wrong reasons. People should go to the gym to improve their sleep quality, to manage their stress levels, to lower their anxiety for those who suffer with anxiety, obviously, and to increase their mental health. And then, and then increment their calorie expenditure that might or might not contribute to your weight loss. Gym by itself doesn't, doesn't make you lose weight because weight loss is about energy deficit. So what happens behind the scenes will not be covered for the fact that you go to the gym 30 minutes or 45 minutes, mm-hmm. right? Now, people think that exercising, I don't do exercise. I don't like even, I don't call exercise, I call movement. The human body was made to, be, to move, right? And people think that, oh, I have to find time to go to the gym and I don't have, as you said, I'm behind the desk nine, 10 hours a day. Mm-mm, bullshit. I don't know if I'm allowed to say bad words, but here it goes. How dare you say it? How dare you? Oh, damn it, man. Kids listen to this show. Uh, uh, yeah. oh, bullshit. Right. Why? Because, because <laughs> bullshit. Why? Because you actually need to move, not to exercise. Now, some people might like to exercise. Great. I'm one of them. Some people might say, I hate go to the gyms. Don't go to the gym. But move your body, move your body daily. Oh, I don't have time to go to, to go for a walk. Do it in the office. Now, what we do and we, what we help people do 
is incorporating moving movement as a strategic break during the day. Mm. So if you make the calculations and if you make a five, if you do a five minutes walk four times in a day, two in the morning, two in the afternoon, in your office, and you go back and forth five minutes, in the end of the day, you have walked 20 minutes and without having to leave your comfort zone of how am I going to accommodate movement. No, the thing is that movement helps to stimulate the blood circulation. And when you stimulate the blood circulation, you're lowering your cortisol, you're absorbing adrenaline, you're stimulating the blood going to the brain, delivering more nutrients, more oxygen, and more glucose. That's the real purpose of movement. It's not to look good. It's not to be on the cover of a magazine or, or to, to lose the, the shredded weight. No, you want to lose weight? Eat smart. You want to go, you want to improve your sleep, move your body. Yeah. You want to manage your stress, move your body. You want to lower your fatigue. In this case, your mental fatigue, move your body. That's the real reason why you need to move your body. And can be, do five squats, do five squats every 90 minutes. By the end of today, count how many squats you did at your home. You didn't go to the gym. Start incorporating the movement and this small and simple action steps that look so simple and ridiculous are going to impact so much in your life because you start going to feel, oh, wait, what was I thinking when I did my squats? Oh, nothing. Here we go. You're resting your brain. Oh, what was I thinking when I was going for my walk with my colleagues? Oh, we're talking about the latest car model. Here we go. You're resting your brain from work. So this is the real benefit of moving the body, not, not to lose weight. Anyone that comes to me and said, oh, can you, sometimes people come to me and I said, oh, can you, can you do me a, a training program? I am not a personal trainer. <laughs> I don't do that. I now I can help you getting traction for you to start moving your body, but you need to find what works for you. What works for me might not work for you from a movement perspective. Some people are a bit more sedentary. There's no problem with that. The problem is that they understand what is the, the real function of movement in their life. And when you find that sweet spot, life is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like this is the thing. Like with regards, I'm a strong believer in small increments makes a difference. Like do two, like make a 2% improvement each day. Mm -hmm. you might not hit 2% each day. You might fall back, but you know what? Over a course of like, yeah, over a course of 100 days, that's a hell of a... That's a new baseline, which is considerably better than what it was before. Mm -hmm. And if you can, um, the power of consistency has to be brought into that. If you can do that consistently over those hundred days, wow, you're like, mm -hmm. you're going to be like some kind of super being compared to what you were before. Like one of the things I often find, even like you say movement, I say exercise, and some people might say health and well-being. Unfortunately, uh, in this sort of day of TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube, it's been kind of hijacked by the wrong sort of elements in some regards, where it's mm. like you've got people who look either super jacked, super like, and like you're like, oh my God, that person. So, like, they look like some like Venetian god or something like this. They look amazing. But in truth, you ask them to run five miles they wouldn't be able to do it uh, mm. but or they are like yeah how can i say it they might be on they might be a little bit saucy like trying to combat all of this sort of like uh, bs information which is out there as well it must be kind of hard getting over all of that sort of imagery and false information like how do you mm. like how do you punch past that how do you get through that to like get right. message so there's two things here there's two things i want i want i want to say uh, first thing is when people come to me and some, a lot of people come to me i i i, I coach ceos around the world I, I, and most of the the common problems everybody has is that i don't have time mm. and i said well but i i my energy is low i'm not moving i everybody knows what they need they need they should be doing but very few actually do it and I always ask a very simple question. Fine. You don't want to do it. Don't do it. What's your plan B? 
and people don't have a plan B. And I said, so that means that you cannot do anything, but you don't have a plan B. So you don't want to move. You don't want to change your habits. You don't want to do, and all this is affecting the way you live. So what's your plan B? Well, if you don't have a plan B, what, you're accepting the defeat now? And these immediately start, people start thinking, oh, wait, wait, maybe I should have a plan B. And my plan B doesn't mean necessarily to be by the book. No, your plan B needs to be something that works for you. Mm. Something that fits into your busy schedule, but something that will make you a little bit better because not doing anything, that's not an, that's not an option. That's not an alternative because that's how many people are so unhappy and frustrated and, and tired. And I tell you something, man. the mental fatigue and the amount of people running on an empty tank from an energy point of view, it's tremendous, tremendous, right? And that's, that's the point. Now, the second point that you talked was uh, the social media. Mm. And you're absolutely right. Not only there are distractions, but also people compare themselves to the others. And that's a big mistake because you're comparing yourself to someone, but you don't know what that someone is actually doing. And so that comparison by default is already against you. You're already putting yourself in a position of being undervaluated because you position that person you're comparing to in a higher degree, but you don't know what's behind that you don't know if that person is eating smart if he's sleeping 10 hours if it's working out you don't know you you only know what you see on that image and you create a belief system in your head that oh that person is doing this this and that but you don't know and what you see on social media is just a tip of iceberg which is most of it is fake right so the the only thing you should be doing and the only one you should be comparing to is to yourself where you were yesterday and how you're going to be tomorrow. That's the real comparison you need to be doing. Not, Oh, I'm, I'm, com- I always, I, I'm comparing my, I'm Portuguese. So I'm going to give an example. When people say, oh, oh you're not, you're Cristiano Ronaldo. So no, I don't want to be Cristiano Ronaldo. I want to be who, Rui 2.0 and then Rui 2.1 and Rui 2.3. I want to be the best I can be for myself. I don't want to compare myself with the others. I don't know what the others have been doing for, my, for, for me to compare with them. It's unfair, unfair to them, unfair to me, right? So what I say is that like, don't compare. And one time I was coaching the, the youngest customer I have is 15. And uh, yeah, and, uh, and one time uh, he was exactly doing that, comparing himself to, I'm not getting the results I should be getting. And that starts with the word should that I should be getting those people on Instagram or a TikTok, whatever was the platform of choice uh, are getting much better than I said, I, you don't, that's irrelevant. Mm. Why you're building up mental stress and emotional stress and putting yourself already on an undervaluated position by comparing yourself to the unknown. It's not correct. No. If you want to compare apples to apples, compare apples to apples, not apples to pineapples. No. It's but, still the same fruit, but they're different. Yes, absolutely. But like, this is the thing. As the old saying goes, uh, comparison is the thief of joy. Uh, like, but like the whole thing is, it also opens, when you do the comparison, it is also kind of a weird ally to entitlement. And when that comes into play, uh, you get people saying that. It's like, yeah. I should be there and I should be doing this. When like, honestly, as you say, you might get a snippet of what someone might be doing on the day to day. Um, For example, um, did you watch the last dance documentary, Michael Jordan? Uh, No. Okay. Like basically whatever you think, same thing with like, same thing with David Beckham, same thing with like uh, Slice, whatever you think their level of, work intensity is forget it you are wrong you are a million times wrong because they go okay of course. you they go there you think that's where they are but they've they've they're way beyond they're in they're in the stratosphere and you're like mm-hmm. oh right and they are sacrificing this and they are doing that so it's like they're giving up many things and like look don't get me wrong 
<laughs> it might not it doesn't some it doesn't come from a healthy place in many respects but that's what they pay that price and i think with like your youngest like client where he's like i should be getting like this is where i should be he, it's so easy to fall into that comparison trap because it's everywhere and like look sometimes people lock on to someone to like sort of help motivate them along and they go i've done this i've followed like they've i followed what they've done i've done this and it ain't gonna happen because where they're genetically is totally different to where that person no, but, but, but look it starts with even using the word should mm. should implies an obligation obligation implies guilt failure so you're already putting yourself when you said I should be there, mm. and because you're not there, you're gonna you're gonna feel bad with yourself, guilt, frustrated, anger, and all these things. Mm. Should implies an obligation. When you choose to be there, implies a choice. You're in control of your life. So when people come and say I should be doing this, no, no, mm. you should or you won't. Because one implies a desire and that desire can lead to frustration and you go back again to the emotional stress spiral that we have in our head. And when you want to be there, but you fail, that's fine. We work around it. Yeah. You make a, make a decision, it makes a choice. You're in control of your life. Look, we're all going to fail. We're going to make mistakes. And that's exactly the, be the, the best part of life because we, we fall to learn how to stand up. And, I, and none of us start running the moment start walking. So when, and that is our decision, our consistency to learn, right? The neuroplasticity of the brain to build new connections and learn. Like, like when people can say, oh, I should be doing this. Oh, I should, that's already comes to me. And I always said like, you're already putting a lot of emotional stress, guilt, shame on yourself as a starting point. Yeah. I like if you want to change, yeah. change because you want. Change because you choose to do. Change because it's your decision, not because it's an obligation. As I was about to say, I like the fact that you bring up failure because one of the things that people don't actually take on board that, okay, if you really want to be successful in this world, you have to fail so many times. It's, uh, it, you go like, oh yeah, how many times have you failed? Only, I failed 10 times. I lost, I lo I lost count. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I failed 10 times. I really want to be successful at this. I want to be the best in the world. It's like, going, eh, then you're not working hard enough for it because that's like, you need to know you're going to have to fail countless times. More times you can actually like stomach because like the 80 20 rule comes into play mm -hmm. so much. Like, yes, you go, oh yeah, I put in 80%, like I put in 80%, like 100% effort. Only, t like, yeah, only 20% of that's going to matter or count. The rest of the 80% is there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And like, if they don't, like people, it's, people don't want to fail, but they need to know they, like, it's okay to fail. Failure mm -hmm. is one. It's also part, it, it, the failure, so, it, it, I'm I'm a kid from '77. I was born in '77, uh -huh. so yeah. I, I grow up. I grow up with with the culture that uh, life is just like this. You always go up. You don't have ups and downs. You don't know what failure is. You go in a career and you build up. And we're not. No one taught us how to deal with failure. No one. And if you fail. You at school, you get you know people who criticize you or your parents or if you have failed at work or if you failed in uh, 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 other spheres of life. People, that's okay. I always say that's okay to fail. That's when you fail that you learn, because when you fail, you understand what's not working, and when you understand what's not working, that's when you actually can improve. So if you don't fail and you always succeed, which I don't believe that that that, that happens to anyone. Because we all fail. We're all humans. There's no such thing as, as perfection. Perfection is another uh, uh, type of stressor we have in life. But if you don't understand what went wrong, how can you make it right? And, and it's like life is binary. Day and night, 
negative and positive. And I always say darkness is nothing more than the absence of light. And people say darkness is a negative thing. No, darkness is the absence of light. So if you open a little hole, you're already going to have a little bit of light. And you learn that you need the hole to get a little bit of light inside. So that is about learning. And learning is about being aware, being present, understanding what did I do right today? What did I do wrong? What was a challenge to me? And when you ask these three questions on a daily basis, a weekly basis, whatever you want to ask, you start learning how you can bypass a roadblock. So failure is very important. As sadness is, as frustration is, as all these difficult emotions that we keep pushing them back because we don't know how to deal with them. It's not because they're bad. No, no, there's no such thing as good emotions and bad emotions. There's emotions that are easy to manage and emotions that are difficult to manage. But all of them have a reason to exist. And exactly the same way as failure. So we fail to learn how to do things differently. Mm. So that's how we become the better version of ourselves. So some people, when they fail, they say, ah, I don't want to come to you. I don't want to do sessions because I haven't done anything. And, the, and I always say, these are the sessions I like. I don't want to have a session where people come to me and say, I did everything good. Something is wrong there. I want a session where people come to me and I said, look, I tried to do something and I failed. Great. Let's try to understand what happened for you to fail. And then we find out that tweaking point, things go exponentially up. Yeah. What I often find and what I often see is like, yeah, especially like, especially in today's like society, look, I'm a child of the 70s as well. And like, this is the thing, like, growing up in the 70s and 80s, you say it was like exponentially like going up. That's what the expectations was. Yeah, but like, this is the thing. Also, in the 70s and 80s, it was a case of there was much more of, yeah, if life slaps you about, yeah, that's life. Move on. Mm. You got to like, yeah, you got to move on. If you don't move on, well, that, <laughs> that, that's, your, that's your lot. Today, and I would say, and I'm not saying this is of like one particular generation, I'm going to say it's across the board. People want to live life in, like, especially in the developed world, in the most comfortable way possible, not experiencing any sort of stress, pain, or anything. What would like, yeah, I've gone through this hardship, which re you mentioned resilience earlier, which mm. if they tip that on, it helped build that resilience. And so they can basically be able to deal with it mentally in a better way when something really heavy does come along, which it it comes to us all eventually. You can't hide exactly. It. But I find that is the sort of main key thing right now. Everyone wants to yeah. be from a place of comfort, and I don't understand how that can help. Exactly, you're ab you're absolutely correct. That people think that not only just comfort there's actually um, a spanish uh, psychologist that used the word comfort comfortability uh in the sense that yeah i, I know it's not a word but it, it's in the sense of people get used to live in their comfort zones and they don't dare to challenge themselves on the sense of growing as individuals right and because you're used to get your ac and you're used to get the work and you have to get a routine and you don't challenge those routines and maybe those habits are not serving you mm. right but you because you're you're living there you it's it's you get used to these things so challenging your comfortability is one thing the other thing is as you said it and very well the new situations we're living in is like we're telling us that life is too perfect and no one is telling us that no life is tough life is hard there's no and and since the kids were telling us the fairy tale like uh forever uh, love and we we go we uh, amazing jobs great careers you know perfect marriage no all these word perfection is nothing more than a stressor in our life and most people that because they fail or they didn't have a happy marriage or they didn't have a happy work or they don't feel happy at work or or fulfilled in life they get a misalignment between their values and the life they have. That's why so many people around 50, like 
they they said oh they have the middle age crisis no middle age crisis is nothing more than a misalignment between their real values and the life they have and they realize though uh, the life that i've been built is a little bit of a failure based on what i really wanted to live because i've been living a life that was imposed to me i'm not saying that you should be anarchist by all means what i'm saying what i'm saying what i'm saying is that uh, okay easy <laughs> no, no no what i'm saying what i'm saying is that we we need to look into what we really want to do with our lives and that's we're gonna have ups and downs mm. and that life is not linear life is irregular unpredictable and that's what makes life fun right it's not like oh i'm gonna be happily ever after i'm sorry again fuck that <laughs> i'm telling you that because it's not and we have to le- accept this we have to accept the unpredict- unpredictability of life in the sense that things are gonna go south sin- things are not gonna go as, as planned jobs are gonna fail marriage is gonna fail there's the the potential of this happen how are we going to manage this? How are we going to manage this perception of this uh, situation that might not be as we wanted to? Mm. And the problems that everybody, the marketing people and, and the stories and Disney, they keep telling us, oh no, life is going to be amazing and beautiful and you're going to have an amazing career and happily ever after, no one's going to do anything, you know? And, uh, no, no, unfortunately, it's not like that. And we have to accept this and learn how to manage this because when things it's the fan and it comes to reality mm-hmm. we don't have the skills or the tools to be resilient to to fight and to give a coping answer a coping or having a coping mechanism to answer to the problem we have in face in front of us mm-hmm. that's why when people become too strict when when stress becomes built up and they go emotional mental all types of fatigue happening because we do have different types of fatigue in the body People go for reward systems, drugs, sex, alcohol, and all these things, because they don't know how to manage these unpredictable situations. So it's, it's, it's life. Let's, let's be realistic and like, life, life is tough. And sometimes we don't, we will not have the energy to, to manage the thing as the way we want it. That's fine. Let's replenish our energy and then tackle the problem. Right? So we need to understand that life is not linear it's it's unpredictable mm. and on that sense learn how to cope with this learn how to cope with sadness learn how to cope with happiness learn how to cope with frustration anger anxiety understanding all these things and when you're there i trust me life is good life is good to be unpredictable because then you can play anything mm. i'd say life is good when you can adapt uh, to like pretty much any sort of circumstance and rise to the challenge. Uh, Like, Mm -hmm. this is the thing, like, yes, you've mentioned resilience a number of times uh, in, like, in this whole conversation, actually. Like, how would, like, if someone went, came to you and went, how can I build my resilience? What would you say to them? Well, resilience is the answer to a stress situation the way you reply or cope with a stress situation that's how you build resilience mm-hmm. right so for example uh, i'm going to give a very simple example for illustration purpose you get into a room it's very hot the room is very hot and then uh, and you start becoming uncomfortable right starting sweating uh, so and 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 then you look around and you feel ah, am i affecting your thoughts or oh, i can't be in this room and then you realize there's a button for AC. You go there, press the button, and the AC starts working. And what did you learn? That you don't need to go through that suffering process when you get into the room and press the button immediately. You have an answer there, right? That's building resilience. You were exposed to a stress situation that was the heat, mm-hmm. and you around, lucky for you, had a coping mechanism that they will give you the answer for that right and next time you come into the same room the first thing you're going to be doing is straight to the button and that you learn that's how you build the resilience i know it sounds a very stupid uh, uh, example but this can be applicable to anything to work right when you get into a situation 
a stress situation again we go back to what stress is anything that disrupts on your static balance and you are exposed to a stressor a stressor that causes a stress situation and you're going to have perceived that situation manageable and manageable good or bad yeah. and then your body is going to give you a coping mechanism and when you take action and you sort out the stress situation that's when you build resilience when you don't build resilience is when you don't take action to the stress situation and that's the alarm system keeps ringing so building resi resilience is managing the stress situations in order to obtain a response mm. right or to get a, 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 a to take you to the next level so that you get stronger that you know uh, is, that you know you're going to be strong stronger and better or faster it's not like, or if you want to give an example of burpees someone that never did a workout you know and like i say you need to do 10 burpees in a minute oh. and people are gonna <gasps> panic how oh, am i gonna do 10 burpees in a minute well doing it and then you learn that you might be doing or not 10 burpees in a minute yes. and that's how you start building your resilience <laughs> i might mean, need to go fast i need to go slower you know it's understanding what type of answer you need to give to the specific problem you have in front of you because that's the answer to, to stress yeah. that's how you build resilience by finding an answer to sort a problem that you have mm. that answer had a mix of neuro linguistic programming as well as like yeah physical like yeah uh exercise and stresses that way uh like you might mm. i know i don't know you must know a gentleman called David Goggins, right? No, the name doesn't ring, but I'm not very good with names anyway. Uh, so. <laughs> okay, David Goggins is an ex Navy SEAL, and um, basically, he is <laughs> like he's all about the yeah, mental toughness, putting yourself like through physical stress, like, yeah, mental stress to like build that resilience, callousing the mind, he would say. And like basically mm -hmm. the one introduction like to how he liked it, he wanted to do this charity, like the toughest charity run uh, to basically help like some fallen, like, uh, have you seen the film? There's a film called Lone Survivor. Uh, mm -hmm. It was like the greatest sort of like um, loss of life by the Navy SEALs at one time. And it was like, he was running for the families for that. So like in order to qualify for this race, this wasn't doing the race. He had to like do this hundred mile, like hundred mile, like running around a track. I think it was like a two, a one mile or two mile track. And like, basically he got to like, he got to mile sort of 70 or 77 or something like that. And basically his body was like shutting down. He like basically sat down in this chair, couldn't like mm -hmm. couldn't get up out of the chair to simply go to a bathroom, which was like, yeah, about three meters away from him. And like, yeah, messed himself, everything like this in the worst possible shape he could be. Started mm -hmm. running again because he's like, the wife said, yeah, like if you, the way you're carrying on right now, you're not going to make it. He ran the last 20 miles, completing 100 miles within 19 hours. You're like, uh, oh my God. So you get like, so quite insane. Ultra runner, everything like that. that yeah. That, that's, two, that's two different things here, that is. Yeah. So one is the mental strength, that yes. is the ability to overcome the physical stress though or the part that the body is telling you, I can't more. Mm -hmm. Have in mind one thing, have in mind one thing. For you to overcome, overcome your, mi your mind, yeah. you need to understand how the brain works. And the brain works by energy efficiency. And there's a buffer as a protection mechanism because the brain doesn't know when you're working out, if the workout is gonna take an hour or 10 days, but we do. But when the brain is telling us, stop, stop, I cannot handle more, it's because our, the brain is starting to get scared from a survival point of view because our energy, internal energy is going to be depleted. So most of the athletes that build resilience is that understanding that what sometimes the brain is telling you, there's still margin of maneuver for you from an energy point of view. So that mental strength is a different thing. It's like being focused and not the, the commission from what's your real target. 
Now there's resilience being built on different ways, mm -hmm. overcoming the uh, grief, overcoming a loss of work, overcoming a, 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 a breakup or, or, or things like that. There's different situations. So you're talking about building a mental resilience that is how am I going to train my brain? And the brain is nothing more than a muscle, yeah. right? Like the rest of the body. How am I going to train my brain to work on my favor and not against me? Yeah. But like this, because that's an important thing. Yeah. Something what ties into that and with the whole story, like when he did that and he completed the hundred, he was like, yeah, like human, like the human mind, the human body only runs on around about 40% of what it truly can achieve what it can truly do so it was like yeah from that day it's like when okay i want to like be able to push myself more and more and more so i can get a hundred percent one of the things he does for fun annually is called a four four forty eight four miles mm. every four hours for 48 hours so oh, wow. yeah I've done it twice myself personally. So, and I wasn't. It, like, this is the thing. It first, like, first few runs, like, first three runs, four runs, fine, no problem. Then, when it starts to get dark and, like, yeah, your like, sleep and fatigue is kicking in, mm. then it starts to get trippy. Like, yeah, to a point where, yeah, it gets real good and then, yeah, start to crash out. It is. Right. It is a physical and mental draining thing. And like anyone who goes, I don't do it with, like they go sleeping, it's cheating, they're wrong. It's madness if you don't do it because, yeah, uh, there'll be times when um, I almost... I'm sure it's tough. But yeah. I'm sure it's very tough. But it's one of those mm. things where doing that, it's controlled. It's like, yeah. But it's the fact of if I look back and go, yeah, I'm going through this hard time, but I managed to mm. do the four four forty eight twice. Wow! Come on, well done. Yeah, come on. At this moment in time, I should be able to push through. Like if I didn't do that, and I turned back and went, "Yeah, what was a really hard moment in my life?" Yeah, I might be able to dig deep and go, "Yeah, bring up some like bit of like this emotional trauma and something like this," but it's. You know what I mean? Might take me down a little bit mm. more dark a path, but it's like, how did I succeed? Well, it took me about eight months to get over that situation to yeah. succeed and I'd make it happen, but it didn't help me in the moment. So it's like, right. But being mm -hmm. able to have these sort of key sort of anchor points in one's life to be able to turn back and go, yes, this is how I overcame and this is how I can use it today to overcome now, I think is very important, vitally important. In this day. Yeah, of course. You're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. But like, this is the thing. I have like been on your Instagram. I've like seen like some of the activities you get up to. Look, look Mr. I get a weighted vest and like, yeah, go at it at uh, hardcore. So yeah, what are some of the things you do to sort of have, have these anchor points to like, yeah, help you through trials and tribulations. All right. So uh, for, first of all, the, one of the things I, I use is I, I'm, I, I'm lucky enough to uh, working out is also my hobby. All right. But I use the body. A, I use the body to calm the mind mm -hmm. because as every, as everybody, I'm emotional, I'm mental. Uh, I have all existential, all these areas. So uh, things that I, I take my life in, in a couple of areas. If you saw it on my Instagram, so I, I take the part of the physical aspect, right? Uh, my body was made to move. So I try to move my body in different ways. I'm a crossfitter, but I swim, I run, I jump. I try to make sure that my body moves in any type of different direction. Because also when you go to the gym, you just do the same workout and you just do Pilates or you just do spinning, You're, the body is just keep working the same muscles on and on and on. Yeah. And it's not healthy for the body. So uh, anything for the body, as, as I say, anyone that plays in the stock market, the first rule of playing the stock market, is you diversify to minimize the risk. Same thing with the body. You diversify to minimize the risk. So as more different things you do, as better it is. So that's the rule number one. So from a movement point of view, 
I take my movement very serious. Uh, I take my nutrition impeccable in the sense of I do, I do, I do, when I mean impeccable, it's not because I only eat broccoli and boiled fish. No, when I mean impeccable is because I allow myself to eat anything I want, understanding that I apply an 80, 20 rule where 80% of my meals are energetic, 20% are emotional and social, which allows me to accommodate all types of foods in my life without restriction. So I don't have that, that problem. Then I have an important thing is my time management. And it's also mentioned there. So I make sure that we tend to overbook more activities in my day, in our days than what they can have. So at some point, if it's just doing work, 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 work and commuting and, and kids to school, at some point, you're going to be frustrated with yourself because you don't have time for yourself. And that's why people take st still time to sleep, to start watching uh, Netflix and other screen times so that they have the sense that they have done something from themselves, which is wrong. But uh, so I take time management very, very, very cautious. Uh, my stress levels are managed uh, to the point. So sometimes I feel myself too stressed and then I have to take action on that, right? Because no one's going to take action for me. So I need to understand uh, if I'm going on a direction, I'm rewarding myself with food. Am I eating my emotions or it's just because I'm actually want to eat that food item. So I look into the situations. Where do I stand from an emotional point of view? Right. And one thing I do have, and I make sure, and that you can see it on my Instagram a lot. <laughs> it's a, the amount of joy I have in my life. I make sure that I have a joyful life. And, and this is very underestimated. People think that people search for happiness. I search for joy. Joy is the foundation of happiness, right? Happiness is just the end result. The good process is the thing. Now, people know they, they have joy annually. Everybody knows what annual joy is when they go on vacation. It's very easy, but that's not enough. You have to have moments of joy, moments of joy daily, moments of joy weekly, moments of joy monthly. Because that's the sense that's going to give you the sense of a fulfilled life. So when you have strategic breaks, and I, I was, I was just, I'm, I'm part of a play, and I'm being doing, I'm going to be on a theater, just to challenge myself to be outside of my comfort zone. And I was in the theater, and that we're, at some point, the, 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 some of the actors were very exhausted. I said, "Why don't you do strategic break?" And they're all like, and one of them, I actually coached him. And one of the, the gentlemen who was there said, uh, you should listen to Hui because what he's, he's going to say is, is actually correct. And I said, why don't you do a strategic break? And they all look at me, what's a strategic break? It's like, that's a break where you're going to do something fun. And that something fun doesn't need to be, oh, I'm going to spend half an hour talking with my neighbor. No, you're going to listen to your favorite song. You're going to sit outside and look to the sun or breathe air or just give a minute to your thoughts to see what you're thinking about. And repeat these three, four times during the day. You're going to have a sense that you're doing something for yourself. And then you're going to have joy during the week. What's your hobby? How do you enjoy life? How you go out with friends, you go uh, gardening, you do painting, you do playing an instrument. It's very important. Because that's when you build up your joy so that people don't feel like, oh, I reached the weekend and I'm, running for, uh, I'm trying to run away from the life I have rather than celebrate the life I live, right? And that's the important thing you need to have. It's joy. And this is very important from a health point of view. Mm -hmm. And that's something that people forget that. And then when you start introducing this small little thing, you're going to see that life changes completely. Is it perfect? No. Do I have moments of uh, that I'm not happy? Yes, I do. Do I have moments where I have high stress levels? Yes, I do. Do I have moments where I feel that my emotions can trigger me and drive me to the to a to a level or a road of a reward uh, system like uh, uh, drinking or eating my emotions or maybe but then I bring back myself to where I am again. Mm -hmm. All right. So being aware of what I'm living and these are the pillars that I try to balance in my life and that's what you see on my Instagram most of the time is working out as a core, having joy as another managing my time, understanding there's time and space for everything. And, and, and that life is fun. Mm.
Uh, basically. Interesting. Do you class joy and gratitude in the same way? No, they're different. Gratitude is to yourself. It's your inner self-talk, right? It's you practicing self-compassion, which is very important because we are very negative to ourselves. We are mean girls to us. We tend to be too Careful, harsh. I'm going to our... get cancer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no. We, we tend to be mean to us. And I always ask, whatever you say to yourself, would you say that to a friend? And the answer most of the time is no. So if you don't say that to a friend, why do you say that to yourself? And that's where I put gratitude in the self-compassion. It's acknowledging where we are. Joy is having fun. Joy is listening to a favorite song. You know, that song from your, that will trigger your emotion. Ah, this was the song that when I was young, I did this and that. That's having joy. It's a different thing. Gratitude is appreciating who you are as an individual. Appreciating and recognizing that you reached so far. You failed most things, but you also did, did right on the other thing. So let's, let's celebrate that. And even if it's just one little thing, even if it's just the fact that you never open a tuna can and you open a tuna can today, let's be grateful for that. Mm.